seven novels, 10 novellas, two short story collections, a couple of works of criticism, and one brain-eating monster that barely resembles a book. And I'm back. It's been a few months, hasn't it? I'm gonna skip the excuses part and just get right to the part where I talk about books. Welcome to Waste Mailing List, a show where I attempt to make sense out of books that go through painstaking efforts to prevent you from doing so. As always, I'm your host, Seth. Today, I'm gonna deviate a little bit from my conventional form here. Rather than my typical single novel deep dive format, I'd instead like to structure today's episode as something of a primer on an author whose translated texts I've recently begun working my way through. This is a preeminent figure in post-war European literature who doesn't receive nearly enough attention in the English-speaking world. A writer whose corpus ranges from stock standard high modernism to German romanticism, and eventually at the end of his career, an experimental prose style that is borderline unrecognizable to both English and German readers alike. I don't know why I'm dragging this tease out. His name's in the goddamn title. Arno Schmidt, everyone. Thanks for dropping by. This is not an author I see the online literary discourse focusing much of its collective attention towards. It's a royal shame if I do say so myself. Most of the chatter that surrounds him tends to focus on his l'enfant terrible notoriety. He's often regarded as just a provocateur or just an experimentalist. And that's where the discussion ends. And look, I'm not going to argue either of those points. Flip open any of his books, even the early fiction, but particularly the late stuff, and you will be confronted with a set of formal techniques that and I'll put money on this, you haven't seen anything like in fiction prior to reading him. This, combined with the scarcity of his works available in print, has unfortunately consigned him to the margins of uh, special interest or niche literature. That's all well and good, but knowing what I know about the online book-loving community's tastes, this is someone who I truly believe a lot of people will come to love if they just had the opportunity to give him a chance. And so, my goal for today's episode, and it's atypical structure relative to what I normally deliver on this channel, is to provide a little bit of a doorway or an entry point into Arno's work, and maybe offer just a little bit of guidance to readers who are feeling intimidated by him. I too am a bit notorious in my own way. Small as my audience may be, I've been told I've gained something of a reputation for long-winded, digressive deep dives that tend to reward the viewer who has already read the book that I'm covering. That is not the approach for today. My intent is not to supplement any individual text here, but rather introduce undecided readers to Arno as an author and make a bit of a case as to why you should track his work down. And look, I get it. He is not the easiest sell. His reputation as both an experimentalist and a quote-unquote difficult author have both acted as kind of notable deterrents to people investing both their time and their cash in his work. And the cash part isn't trivial either. Since most of Schmidt's books are out of print, they'll often go for hundreds apiece on the resale market. I don't blame an undecided reader on not wanting to spend $200 on a copy of the collected stories when they're not even sure if they're going to be able to understand it. If this sounds like you, my hope is that by the end of this episode, I will have given you both a degree of confidence and a little bit of a framework to approach his work. Moreover, stick around for the last section. There's a very real possibility that in the near future we'll be getting an upcoming influx in the availability of Schmidt's books. All right, let's dive in. Oh, and as always, uh, audio and text versions of this episode, description box, you know the whole thing. Let's do this. <laughs> I came to Schmidt the way that I suspect most people do. I heard rumors, whispers floating around of this massive 1,500-page folio-sized hardback book written in columns with a orthographically unique series of fractured and grafted words. 
This book in question had only a single print run in English. Shortly after, it uh, immediately disappeared off the face of the earth and it survived only by the few hundred brave souls who had the foresight to purchase it when it was going for a measly 70 US dollars. Gotta say, there aren't many points in my life where I wish I was more online, but in this case I'm gonna have to make an exception. On the off chance that you're not familiar with the book that I'm referring to, hang in there. We'll circle back to that a little bit later. In the meantime, let's back it up and focus in on the mind from which that particular leviathan grew. Arno Schmidt's career as a writer is uniquely contradictory. He was both preeminently influential on in the development of German modernism and at the same time massively and widely underread, especially outside of Germany. I mean, for starters, the first piece of extra-textual information that I read when putting together this episode was a blog titled Writers No One Reads. It's a great piece, by the way. I've linked to it below. Part of what makes an in-depth study of Schmidt's work particularly challenging is the brutal paucity of research and uh, academic literature there is on him. And that's to say nothing of his broader readership. Even today, he's found very little in the way of a commercial audience, which you know, is usually the case with high concept experimental authors, but hey, I work with what I've got. All right, so what's worth knowing about Schmidt as we approach his work? Because he wrote in a deeply individualist, almost solipsistic style, and that was informed in part by his social isolation, I think you can't talk about the writing without first talking about the writer. If you listen closely, you can actually hear the sound of Roland Barth grinding his teeth under his tombstone right now. Born in 1914, Schmidt led a relatively unremarkable life until the 30s. At the outset of the Second World War, he was almost immediately drafted into the Wehrmacht, where he remained in service of Nazi Germany's armed forces until 45. From there, he fled to West Germany and eventually surrendered to the Brits in Lower Saxony. The personal history isn't irrelevant here, no matter what Roland Barth says. Schmidt's work, particularly his early work, which you'll come to see if you read the collected novellas, is intimately informed by his experience working under a fascist regime. I mentioned earlier that Schmidt presents as something of a contradiction, and that sentiment absolutely extends to his political views. He did serve on the front line of the unified war effort in Nazi Germany, and that was despite holding vocal anti-Nazi views. But in saying that, he doesn't cut neatly into any partisan shape. He was a fierce critic of both East and West Germany. He wasn't a conservative or a socialist democrat or even a Marxist. Most of his attacks, both in his prose and his nonfiction, were lobbed at the modern European condition as a whole. So how do I characterize him? To borrow the subtitle from one of his early pieces, Anthemesis, Wie ich euch hasse. How I hate you all. By the way, as just a little disclaimer, my German pronunciation is rudimentary at best, so go easy on me if you can. Now, I'm cautious of not leaning too heavily into the cranky German stereotype, as I don't want to turn you off from him as both a person and, more importantly, a writer, by painting him in a monochromatic shade of grey. If his fiction is indicative of anything, it's that in spite of the sweeping misanthropy, he was also incredibly funny and irreverent as an author. As loath as I am to use this term, I do think it applies here. He reminds me of the early postmodernists, someone like a, a Gaddis, like J.R. Gaddis, who has this virtuosic ability to toggle back and forth between cerebral, high concept meditations of what it's like to live under oppressive existence and also just crass blue humor. You'll see that incredibly densely in something like JR, which I recommend if you like Schmidt, and vice versa. I wonder who else is good at that. But let's circle back a bit here. Schmidt is well known for completely retreating from society in the last 20 years of his life. It was here, after the Second World War and living in relative isolation in Lundberg Heath and eventually Bargfeld, 
where he wrote the majority of his major works. Critics have tried to infer a political sensibility based on this life choice, but personally, I don't give a shit. If anything, I've taken John Peters' viewpoint. He had neither patience nor interest in the cultural establishment and wanted to maintain his artistic integrity without any commercial or socialite influence. But to put it simply, he just wanted to be left the hell alone so he could do his thing. Now there's a lot more I could delve into his personal life and how it relates to his work, but I think I'm going to leave some of that material for the later deep dive episodes when I get into his work on a, a more granular scale. <laughs> Let me address the first elephant in the room. Schmidt had an extremely esoteric approach to both orthography and syntax, which I suspect is the reason that people often refer to him as a Wakeian. That is to say, uh, writing in the shadow of James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. There's no denying it. It's well documented that Schmidt was both an obsessive reader and scholar of Joyce. But is this an apt comparison? I'm going to give that idea the benefit of the doubt here. Now, Let's throw up my disclosure flags early here. I have not read The Wake cover to cover. I don't even have a copy on my shelf right now to show you. I uh, sold my last one and I'm waiting for my current copy of the Faber edition to arrive. Anyway, not the point here. The best I can say for myself at this stage is having taken bite-sized chunks out of it and mostly tiptoed around the thing by reading critical and academic works on it. If that eliminates any credibility I have to speak on it, then fair enough. Skip forward to the next section. To those of you still here, let's talk Joyce for a few minutes. As a wake dilettante, I would combine the descriptions of a few different scholars in describing the language of that novel as polysemitic idioglossia. Brody, when you go to edit this, can I have you put that term on screen, please? Polysemy is the ability for an icon or a symbol to convey multiple meanings. Idioglossia is basically a blanket term to describe purpose-built idiosyncratic language that's used by only a small number of people. The intersection between these features is basically a form of prose in which multiple meanings are encoded but layered under a veneer of seemingly nonsense language, which I assure you is far from nonsense. That much should have been established by now. Now I'm being mindful not to dwell too deeply on the wake because that is a particular maelstrom that I am very susceptible to getting sucked into and this is not a Joyce episode. Suffice it to say, the wake is written in a highly stylized parody of English that uses composite words and portmanteaus and neologisms and so on. It was Joyce, you know. Scholars have been arguing for a century as to what was the purpose that Joyce was trying to achieve with this particular technique. Now there's a few different angles you could take here, but I want to focus on one fairly well-established perspective. The language of the wake is meant to convey the operations of the unconscious mind. We happy with that? Perfect. Let's put a pin in Joyce for now. If Schmidt was using Joyce as a model, then there are several similarities from which we could infer influence. Arno was heavily invested in exploring the uh, unconscious and subconscious mind. He was also very liberal in his uh, deconstruction and reconstruction of the individual etymonic units of language. These elements are inarguably Joycean. But when I browse through criticism of Schmidt's work, it seems like every single review and every single paper I come across references this influence. And that suggests a degree of uh, derivativeness which I just don't think is fair. Whether or not you think this is a valid comparison is entirely up to you. But before I surrender myself to the old adage, different strokes for different folks, let me punt this to someone who actually has authority on the subject of Schmidt. John E. Woods, Schmidt's translator, said in an interview with the Kaleidoscope, there's a link below if you're interested, that the comparison of Zettel's Traum, Schmidt's legendary magnum opus, and Finnegan's Wake isn't particularly useful. To quote from him directly, both texts are concerned with language and the metacognitive nature of thought, but the dream isn't as densely encoded in its use of language. Moreover, the orthography of these texts are wholly unique from one another. The comparison really ends and these are my words now, at these are both big, difficult, seemingly indecipherable books 
written in a, a highly modified version of their target language. This isn't the last that I'm going to say on the subject of Schmidt and the wake, but I'm going to leave it there for now as I've got quite a bit of Schmidt content in the pipeline. Let's bookend the subject here. Yes, Arno's work draws stylistic and thematic elements from the wake. However, if you're using this as the sole heuristic through which to approach his entire corpus, a lot of what makes him particularly unique will fall by the wayside. So I say, keep an open mind. All right, let's talk about this guy's form and style, as I think this is one of the more outwardly unique characteristics of Schmidt's writing. If you've been lucky enough to flip through his work, particularly the late career pieces, which are sometimes referred to as his typo scripts, you've been probably struck by a couple of things that look particularly odd on the page. The presentation of text can be extremely alienating at first glance. And I suspect this is the reason why the overwhelming majority of Schmidt's books remain unread on the shelf. And fair enough, maybe that's just speculation. But I happen to know that all four volumes of the Dolky series sold only a little over a thousand units apiece, and not a single one of them has over a hundred logs on Goodreads. And you know what? If you're guilty of this, I don't blame you. <laughs> the first time that I cracked open Boondocks Moondocks, I couldn't figure out what the hell I was looking at, let alone what was being said. And that's because Schmidt's prose, particularly in the later works, is actually the amalgam of several different techniques operating in parallel. And that can be distressing to initially encounter to those who don't have the context as to why he presents language in this way. But I insist, if you take the time to wrap your head around these key features, his work becomes immediately more enjoyable and more digestible. Now, before I get into a few of the specific features at play here, I will also note that there was a political motivation that heavily informed Schmidt's style. But I'm going to save that for part of the discussion in the next episode in this series. Let's just keep it to the nuts and bolts for the time being. There's a number of other orthographic elements he uses, which I'm not going to get into here, but I will discuss all of them at length eventually. And I'm definitely just going to edge my way around the three major typo scripts, as that's a particular can of words that's going to need a lot more than an introductory episode to unpack. But let's cover the basics. The first of Schmidt's idiosyncrasies is his use of pointillation. Flip through any of the first four volumes of its early fiction and you'll notice that he favors paragraphs with hanging indentation. A lot of these. So much so that his text can actually give the bullet point or list-like appearance. He referred to this as uh, rastered or pointillated prose. I can say after having worked through around 600 pages of his work continuously, you grow quite accustomed to it quite quickly. But that doesn't explain the reason as to why he uses this technique. I'm going to paraphrase his explanation to this approach. In the evening, one recalls the past day and has the feeling of an epic flow of events, a continuum. There is no such epic flow, but a damaged daily mosaic. Rather, the events of our life jump. It's a string of pearls of small units of experience. From midnight to midnight is not one day at all, but 1,440 minutes, and of these, at most 50 are significant. This porous structure, also our perception of the present, results in a holy existence. Its reproduction, by means of a corresponding literary process, was the reason for me to start another series of experiments. The meaning of this second form is to replace the formerly popular fiction of the continuous action, with a prose structure that does justice to our human way of experience. It's leaner, but more trained. The outcome of this pointillated technique is a fragmented elliptical flow of narrative information. He rejects a continuous action of his stories and instead opts into a style that jumps from thought to thought. It's up to the reader to fill the gaps between these individual units of diegesis. Each of these rasters or points indicates the emergence of a new thought, a mimetic representation of Arno's view of consciousness. The string of pearls, as he puts it. Though it may seem like it at times, it's not quite free and direct discourse. It's something like uh, Ulysses, particularly the Stephen Daedalus chapters. He tends to remain locked to a single narrator, usually one who shares particular characteristics with himself. In fact, 
I don't think I've read a single one of his stories which doesn't feature a first-person narrator. But I'd have to double-check that, so don't quote me. Anyways, just remember, as a Wakeian, reflecting the processes of thought, both conscious and unconscious, was an integral part of Schmidt's creative ethos. Schmidt also favored columnation in his text. If you're starting with the early works or that's all you've read, you may have gotten away without encountering this style. But in the late years of his career, right around the time that he wrote Boondocks Moondocks, he started to arrange his prose into columns or Texttrainen, which he claimed was a technique that he explicitly borrowed from Finnegan's Wake. He would divide the columns according to uh, narrative content, theme, source, uh, sometimes all three at once. In Boondocks Moondocks, one column follows the narrative which concerns a set of characters on Lundberg Heath in 1959, and the second column is focused in on a group of people who are living on a colony on the moon in 1980. This is one way that he used columns, to divide his stories by both plotline and narrative. Though it is worth knowing that the distinction between individual columnar divisions often blurs, as he's notorious for interpolating and interweaving individual storylines and plot elements. Don't expect a clear distinction is what I'm saying. But it's not just about dividing narrative. He also used it as a thematic tool. His columnar structure reached its stylistic peak with Zettel's Traum, the big book. We'll get to that. Wherein he separated each of the individual units of text based on their theme. The main narrative can be found on the center stack of the text block with extra textual literary references down one side and a faux scholarly commentary down the other, both flanking the main story. Like in Boondocks Moondocks, the structure, such as he alleges to have existed at all, often begins to blur and disintegrate, lending credence to my belief that he often applied his rules arbitrarily. But the guy knew how to have fun on the page. There's a great scene partway through Evening Edged in Gold, which I'm reading right now, where two characters are deep in a hearty discussion and pacing up and down a road. To reflect the ping-pong nature of their discussion, the left-hand pages track top to bottom, and the right-hand pages track bottom to top, and that continues back and forth for several pages. Some people might find this shit goofy, and I'll admit, he gets a bit ridiculous at times, but I'm always happy to humor his eccentricities. And then there's the odd deployment of typography. Schmidt favored a grammatical style which, to be perfectly blunt about it, says fuck it to all the conventionally understood rules of grammar and punctuation. As far as I can tell, he seems to have thought this clarified the reader's sense of tone and rhythm, as well as add a kind of uh, musicality to particularly dialogue. But there's a little more to it than that. Here's Schmidt justifying his approach. Punctuation. It can be used as stenography. When I write, she looked around. The outcome, with an equal sign, I despise Websterian rules for compound words. It's not an outcome, but an outcome. Is that the colon becomes the inquiring open face. The question mark, the torsion of the body turned to ask. And the whole of the question retains its validity. If you're following along and thinking to yourself, that sounds an awful lot like emojis, you would be absolutely right. Emojis in the 50s. Wild, right? Now, as always, little more to it than that. Schmidt had a fascination with antiquity and language as a tool to understand the mind. This becomes readily apparent if you read his early works many of which are set in the classical era of ancient Greece. Using punctuation in this novel sort of way, I see him as reviving a logographic system that conveys information and emotion pictographically. An inquired open face, yeah? It's an interesting historical lexical experiment, and it also acts as a sort of emotional complement to the content of his sentences. And I'll give him credit, there is a rhythm to it, Kind of a jazzy rhythm. You know, he likes to do this thing, dash, dot, dash, dot, dash, dot. It's got a very percussive element to the pauses between individual people discussing uh, whatever the fuck they discuss about. Usually sex and farts. It's Schmidt for you. Anyway, we're not there yet. Now, personally, I'm still coming to grips with how he systematized this uh, structure and style for consistency, as it does feel 
very disjointed at times. I initially doubted myself in my reading of him and wondering if, you know, all of these specific granular rules to his style were actually being deployed rigorously and all of it was just flying over my head. Because it seems like the moment I understood the rules, he would change the game in some marginal or obtuse way. I later felt very vindicated when reading a note from Johnny Woods on his experience of translating him. Schmidt usually had his reasons for the typography, but sometimes he was careless. Despite his avowals of meticulously orchestrated punctuation, I must admit I often find no real consistency. Usage varies from text to text and can even seem out of sync within a given text. Truth be told, I think, because Schmidt was almost entirely an autodidact, that he mostly went off of feel and instinct a lot of the time, and that his system evolved organically without a rigidly prescribed set of rules and instructions. Even after only having read a dozen or so of his stories, I see him as experimenting with different approaches to language and structure, and a lot of what we encounter on the page is shrapnel left over from experiments both failed and successful. But his style was his style, and I'm here for it, even if it was messy at times. I will hedge, however, and suggest that this messiness does become more rigidly organized and functionally relevant when you start to run a fine-tooth comb through his Edom theory. Dear God, the Edom theory. For my money, this is what Schmidt was most notorious for. The evolution of his language from stylistically unique to lexically experimental to batshit insane. In the late 50s, the mid to late stage of his career, Schmidt became fascinated with the functional interrelation between a writer's dreams and the execution of their written language. This came about as a sort of combined influence with his previous preoccupation with Finnegan's Wake and his newly discovered fascination with Freud's interpretation of dreams. It was through a combination of symbolism and pointillation and columnation, polysemitic word usage, that he eventually arrived at his Etym theory. This would be the bizarre, highly modified version of German and eventually translated English that gained him legendary status in the critical community. The Etym theory proposes that the root or base morphemes of words called etymons or sometimes etyms are expressions of unconscious thought and desire. Through the mouthpiece of his narrator in the big book, capital B, capital B, Schmidt argues that even in conventional written language, something like what you would find in bog-standard German modernism, unconscious thought and desire is driving all of our expressions of vocalized and unvocalized language. However, those unconscious drives remain buried in the language, unconscious or subconscious, if you will. It's kind of right there in the word, right? Schmidt's approach through the adoption of Freudian symbol interpretation aims to expose these unconscious drives and make the implicit explicit. So what you'll often find if you work your way through his books is that there's a lot of, um, how should we put it, sort of smutty sexual innuendo buried, not buried's not even the right word, just kind of lurking directly under the surface of what's being actually expressed by the characters. I'll actually give you an example here because you can actually get it right in the title of one of his books. Uh, Evening Edged in Gold, a fairy tale farce, 55 scenes from the countryside for patrons of errata. What you'll actually see is that in the title here, fairy tale farce, look at this last capital A. You know, you've got arse buried in there, one of the many fixations that the characters find in this book. 55 scenes from the countryside. I don't think I need to explain that one to you. For patrons of errata, yes, there's obviously a lot of conflicting things going on here in the way that information is delivered, but it's also very sexually charged. Charged. So, buried underneath the explicit errata, you also have the errata. You kind of get the idea. This is really only a surface level kind of exploration of what's going on, but I'd like to think that gets the point across. 
I'm going to leave it there for the time being because if this series goes where I intended to, there is going to be a lot to unpack, particularly with the two major typo scripts, both Zettel's Traum and Evening Edged in Gold. Look, this theory is perfectly understandable on its own terms. But as I alluded to earlier, the complexity with Schmidt doesn't come because he's employing one single complex technique, but rather a number of different techniques operating all in tandem, and they're often interrelating with each other in frustrating and fascinating ways. To borrow a quip that's been lobbed at Finnegan's Wake, the use of the language becomes the story. This is why it is nothing short of a miracle that John E. Woods managed to render this man's prose into readable and poetic English. And speaking of John E. Woods... <laughs> I've reached a point in my own reading life where I can afford certain translators the same carte blanche that I offer my favorite authors. In the same way that I will read anything new written by, let's see, uh, Thomas Pynchon, William T. Volman, Laszlo Krasnolarkai, I will also read anything translated by Max Lawton, Ottilie Malzit, and Johnny Woods, to name a few. Woods is one of the titans of contemporary English translation, the kind of powerhouse that other translators aspire to be. He sadly passed away this year at the age of 80 at his home in Berlin. Through an odd series of circumstances, I've actually become somewhat friendly with a friend of his who attended his funeral, and by all accounts, it was a rather lovely service, so I'm glad to hear that. What he left behind was an absolute mountain of phenomenal translated works by... Let's go down the list here. Uh, Thomas Mann, uh, Gunther Grass, uh, Patrick Suskind, and uh, of course, Arno Schmidt. Woods came to Schmidt by way of a friend. He recalls that encounter in his introduction to the collected novellas. Schmidt represents a revitalization of the German language that is very hard for any translation to reproduce. Back in the early 70s, when I was struggling to learn German, a dear and wise friend pressed a book into my hand, and with a knowing wink, it was Arno Schmidt's Scenes from the Life of a Fawn. From the first page, I knew this was a voice speaking in a language I had found nowhere else in Germany. It did not take him long to transition from obsessive reader to devoted translator. In 1976, Woods joined his then-wife, Yorika Dorda, on a sabbatical to the University of Massachusetts, and along with her, she brought a copy of Evening Edged in Gold, one of Schmidt's legendary typoscript pieces. Woods, who was struggling to write his own novel at the time, decided to put that on pause and try his hand at translating something instead. If you're lucky enough to have gotten your hands on a copy of Evening Edged in Gold, you'll no doubt find this ironic and a little bit hilarious, as this has got to be one of the densest texts of German prose in existence? Question mark? It's sort of like, I don't know, showing up for your first day in the London Symphony Orchestra as a violin player, and they ask you to audition with Paganini's uh, 24 Caprices. Fucking ridiculous is what I'm saying. <laughs> he later recalled regretting the choice to start with one of Schmidt's denser works, as he said his experience in translating the earlier simpler stuff actually informed a more refined, uh, more mature product by the time he got to the big book. But whether it was early or late in his career, I believe his professional philosophy remained consistent the entire time. The nirvana of what I do is to capture for an English-speaking reader, let's hope, most of the aesthetic and intellectual charm, delight, and beauty of the original. Now, this is far from the last that I have to say on the subject of Woods, but given that this is just an introduction, I'm going to leave it there for the time being. We are, and continue to be, exceedingly privileged to have a mind as creative and as sharp as Woods, having delivered for us the lion's share of Schmidt's works into English. Furthermore, we are just as lucky that these books managed to find a home at a press that's willing to put their money behind them. Chad W. Post, the editor-in-chief at Dalkey Archive Press, posted a newsletter on his Substack in early 2021 titled 
How Does This Get Read? And you can find this on his blog still today. Uh, the name of it is Mining the Dalky Archive, unless I'm greatly mistaken. In this piece, he talks about Dalky's history with Schmidt and how they went about acquiring Schmidt's early work, how that led forward to producing, publishing, and distributing a book that weighs 12 pounds. <laughs> it's a great piece. I highly recommend you check it out. There's a link to it below. In 1994, Dalkey launched a project to bring Arno Schmidt's work to an Anglophone audience via a four-volume translation campaign entitled Early Collected Fictions. What was it? 1949 to 1964, I think? I'd have to double check that. These four volumes were released sequentially over a four-year period and to reasonably decent acclaim, I might have you. And that was kind of it for about 20 years until something else entirely arrived into the world. These four volumes include the collected novellas in 94, Nobo Daddy's Children in 95, the collected stories in 96, and two novels in 97, which contains his, obviously, two novels, uh, The Stony Heart and Boondocks Moondocks. These four volumes comprise the main text that I intend to cover on this channel. Now, I do have my ambitions. The typo scripts are something I'm interested in. There's something I'm currently reading. There's something that's doing my fucking head in, if I'm perfectly honest. But once I feel I do have the language sufficient to articulate something that is, I don't know, I'd like to think reasonably instructive or informative to the reader, then I'd like to put that out into the world too. And I've actually found a few other, how shall I say, greater authorities on the subject of Schmidt than myself who are interested in collaborating. And I think we'll keep it cryptic for the time being. Suffice it to say, Schmidt's work presents something of a new obsession to me. And so, this would be the part where I anticipate the question that will undoubtedly be asked the moment this video comes out. Where should I start? Now, it should already be abundantly clear that the scope of this primer on Schmidt is entirely limited by the language in which I read it. By that token, and the current level that my German is at, I am limited to what has been translated in English, almost exclusively by Johnny Woods. All right, let's get a lay of the land here. Seven novels, 10 novellas, two short story collections, a couple of works of criticism, and one brain-eating monster that barely resembles a book. He was also a prodigious translator into German, which would inform the subject matter which comprises that brain-eating monster I mentioned earlier. I highlighted the four main volumes of prose earlier, but to reiterate, we have Volume 1, The Collected Novellas, Volume 2, Nobo Daddy's Children, Volume 3, The Collected Stories, and Volume 4, Two Novels. Now, this isn't the entirety of what's available for Schmidt in English. There's also his two volumes of radio dialogues and his third major typo script, A School for Atheists, all of which were put out by the press Green Integer, and they're still available today. Suffice it to say, you've got a reasonable body of literature to choose from. So that begs the question, where do you start? Well, you could go the Johnny Woods route and start with the behemoths, either Zettelstrom or Evening Edged in Gold, but I would suggest to you that that is a very bold choice. Not a wrong choice per se, but a risky one. As I outlined in the previous section, these texts are exceedingly hostile to the reader in terms of their length, style, and the density of their references and allusions. Normally, I'm all in favor of the hold my beer approach to these sort of books. Reading is an extreme sport, to borrow Chris Via's words. But remember, these two books, Evening Edged in Gold and Zettel's Traum both go for a minimum, really, of $800 these days. And I would hate to see a reader invest that kind of money only to find out that the author is not for them. So for that reason, I urge you, start earlier in his career. It's not just about the money. You'll also have the benefit of easing yourself into his style, much in the same way that it took him time to ease into it himself. Let me once again offer you Woods as a guide here. Where do we start? The editors have chosen the novellas. In Schmidt's hands, a most elastic genre, 
which he tugged and squeezed to suit his fancy. It was his genre of choice in the early years, and for that reason alone, the ten novellas will serve nicely as a door into his word universe. All right, so you can go with the stylistic or chronological beginning. That's where I started, and that's where I would suggest personally. But I understand if you find an assortment of novellas a bit of a lackluster entry point. So how about the next volume? Nova Daddy's Children may be your first attempt to explore Arno Schmidt's world of literary mind games. Or perhaps you bought volume one of the Dalky Archive edition of his collected early fiction, and after reading that assortment of novellas find that, maybe against your better judgment, you're intrigued, even hooked on his quirky prose. Either way, with this early trilogy of novels, and my introduction will primarily be devoted to whether they form a trilogy, and if so, in what sense, you are about to encounter something very close to the crux of the Schmidian Manor. All right, all right. He's got me. He's got me. I'd let him sell me on this. I wouldn't mistake crux for peak here, but his point stands firm. By the time he got to Nobo Daddy, Schmidt had a fairly good command on what he was doing here. But again, we're talking a trio of novellas here. Maybe you hunger for a full-length novel, in which case, volume four, two novels, it's right there in the name, that would be the appropriate choice for you. Interesting little aside for you, of the four volumes of collected early fiction, the two novels is the only one that doesn't contain an introduction. If you want a little bit of insight as to what happened and the kind of, hmm, how shall we word it, background drama that was going on during the production of these texts, you should read Stephen Moore's book, Dalky Days, because there's an excellent little bit on the Arno Schmidt experience in there. I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. Even if you have that hunger, that craving for a full-length novel, you may find yourself in over your head if you start with Boondocks Moondocks, as this is suggested to be kind of the stylistic link between the still fairly grounded early works and the, um, I'll use my same term again, batshit insane later works. If you do go the novel route, the other one of the two novels, The Stony Heart, is still fairly digestible, and so that would be decent for an uninitiated reader who wants kind of a full-length text. It's not really fair, though, because the novellas are still entirely self-contained, and even at, you know, 20 to 50 pages, they still feel like entire worlds. See, this is what makes this so hard for me. Whatever you choose to go with, the problem remains the same. These books are not readily available in English. I am well aware of this myself, having spent the better part of two years consistently hunting for the first four volumes of the Dalky series. And to be a little bit transparent here, this is why I considered not even going through with this episode or the continuation of the volumes of Schmidt's early fiction. I don't want to be the guy who goes on YouTube flaunting his rare books and going, na 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 look what I have, which you don't. Nobody daddy likes that guy. However, if you're patient and consistent with your searching, they do come up at an affordable price, which is how I found them myself. My mate Nick over at 11th volume, whose feed you should follow, by the way, he found a copy of two novels for $8. This is on average going for 200 plus. I myself paid 50 for reference. But the main reason why I'm choosing to carry on with this series will be touched on in the last section of this video. But before we get to that, let me address the... Let's be real. I know what a few of you are here for. That brain-eating monster as I referred to it earlier. You want it? You want the money shot? All right, here it is. Zettel's Tom, also known as Bottom's Dream in its English translation. All 5.9 kilos of it. Yes, I weighed it. And I feel every one of those kilos, I might add. <laughs> and Jesus Christ. Do not ask me what I went through to get this. Would you believe me if I told you that Evening Edged in Gold was even harder to find? And would you believe me if I told you that this went for a measly 70 US dollars when it was first printed? Just to make something apparent here, I'm not gonna be talking in any analytical sense about this book today, not least of all because I've only read a small portion of it at this point. But as I alluded to earlier, I have been speaking with a number of people in the community who are interested to get together and do something of a collaborative project on it, so stick around. We'll get there. Now, 
I don't know about you, but I think this book is a bit of a physical comedy act in and of itself. Let me give you some specs here. It is 28 centimeters wide, it is 36 centimeters tall, and it is 9 centimeters thick. 1500 pages. The technical name for this is a DIN A3 format, in which very few books are printed these days. And this would be the format that Schmidt's three major typo scripts, Bottom's Dream, Evening Edged in Gold, and A School for Atheists were all printed. Want a few more specs? How about a word count for you? Here's a few comparisons. Moby Dick, 206,000 words. Gravity's Rainbow, 325,000 words. Infinite Jest, 488,000 words. War and Peace, 561,000 words. Karl Ove Kanaskard's entire Mein Kampf series, 1 million words. Bottom's Dream, 1.3 million words. Now, because this has been an unexpectedly dense episode, I'm gonna give you a breather here and just flip through Bottom Stream for a couple of minutes here for your visual enjoyment. Use this as an opportunity to grab a coffee, surf ABE books, do what you gotta do. That's enough literary dick swinging for the moment. I actually want to use this as an opportunity to talk about the history and the logistics of this book. According to Chad Post, 2,500 of these were printed, and around 2,000 of them sold. I have heard rumors floating around that a large block of them suffered severe water damage during storage in a warehouse somewhere, and that may account for the other 500 on the ledger, but not in circulation. But again, just rumors, just whispers, I don't work for Dalkey. If you've spent time on book Twitter and follow Dalkey Archive or any of its other figureheads, you've probably seen Twitter users hassling Chad Post and Will Evans to please reprint Bottom Stream. I know because I've been that insufferable guy on more than one occasion. Will, if you're watching this, mea culpa. And look, to those of you asking the question, I get it. If you're a lover of big and challenging and stylistically complex books and you see this thing, you immediately, viscerally want it. It's a, a textual anomaly and just a gorgeous object. But before you go hassling publishers to reprint it like I did, I want you to consider what goes into making and producing a book like this. In that newsletter I referenced earlier, Chad Post discussed the practicalities of what goes into producing a book like Bottom Stream. While he wasn't employed by Dalkey at the time, he did have enough fairly rigorous insider industry knowledge from working at Open Letter that he was able to make fairly reasonable assessments. The estimated cost of materials alone to print 2,500 copies would be around $50,000. Fair enough, pricey, but doable. Then we gotta talk translator fees. John E. Woods was a multiple award-winning legend in his career as a translator and was compensated appropriately as such. For his Thomas Mann translations, he earned 150 US dollars for every thousand words. So, if we take that rate and extrapolate it forward to a 1 million plus word novel, his translation fee would be at least $150,000. Then we have to consider ancillary costs, marketing, rent, operations, proofing, typesetting, editing, etc. The absolute minimum we're talking here is $200,000 
just to bring it from an ambitious idea and into readers' hands. So, if Dalkey sold 2,000 copies at 70 USD a piece, they would have grossed around $140,000. After all the back ends and seller fees added up, Dalkey earned an estimated $50,000 on the entire run of Bottom's Dream. This is back of the napkin math, guys. We're talking $150,000 loss on this monster. So, I want you to keep this in mind as we move through this series. Because Dalkey, particularly under their new leadership, is doing absolutely phenomenal things to try and balance the financial practicalities with bringing readers the incredible, ambitious, and unique texts that they want. And I want to make one more thing abundantly clear. I don't work for Dalkey. I'm not formally affiliated with them. I don't have any pecuniary relationship with them. The most I can say is that we've got a bit of a relationship of what I hope would be mutual admiration. Probably a little more admiration from my end, but that's to be expected. I only cover books on this channel that I'm interested in. And it just so happens that Dalkey publishes works that I am pretty consistently fascinated with. So if you're going to accuse me of publisher propaganda, you can check that shit at the door. Because I'm not paid to be here. If someone wants to put money into my pocket for doing this, my DMs are always open. It's either that or OnlyFans. <laughs> To close out this video, I want to end on a note of optimism. Yes, it's no secret that Schmidt's books are scarce these days. But there are very strong rumblings in the publishing world that we can expect a renaissance in Schmidt's work available in coming years. A Schmidtissance, if you will. And it all starts again with Dalkey Archive. In January 2021, Dalkey Archive retweeted a fabulous post from Louis Panini stating, Hold tight to your first editions. Schmidt reprints and lots more info coming soon, y'all. This was followed shortly by a press release from Dalkey announcing the arrival of what they're referring to as the Essential series. The Essential series is a collection of vital reissues from the Dalkey Archive backlist. Dalkey will reissue 10 titles per season. As the series expands, the press will give other classic works the versions they deserve, including books by Gertrude Stein and Arno Schmidt in coming seasons. This right here is what has me so excited about the future of Schmidt's readership in English. As it stands, Dalkey has expressed a strong intent to reprint all of Schmidt's major works. I reached out to them last month to see if they had any updates on the subject, but they said they have nothing formal to announce at this stage. Plenty of uh, logistical issues to sort out under the hood. I get it. However, I can see that a reissue of Nobo Daddy's Children is available already for pre-order, and I've put a link to it below. The stated publication on that pre-order currently is June 27th, but I saw a tweet from them a little while back that suggested that it's being pushed forward a couple of months, so just Keep that in mind. Nevertheless, I have plenty of reasons to think, more than I'm letting on, I might add, that Schmidt's work will become more readily available in English over the next few years, possibly even months. I also want to make another resource available to anyone who's watching this. Recently, a mutual book Twitter user who goes by Millington and I uh, took it upon ourselves to overhaul the veritable ghost town that was the Arno Schmidt subreddit. I don't know how many of you who are watching this are unfortunate enough to be regular users of Reddit, but if it happens to be the case, we welcome you to join the sub anytime. While it's still a small community over there, Mill and I have started compiling resources to help readers understand, but more importantly, just enjoy Schmidt's work. Our wiki, which you can find on the sub, includes a full bibliography, supplementary texts, reviews, criticism, etc. It's a real crowdsourced operation. One of our users, uh, being nothingness, I think they go by, is regularly posting their Bottom's Dream annotations, which you can find on there as well. We're working on a Schmidt buyer's guide as well until such a time as Dalkey makes the entire series readily available again. If that's of interest to you, drop us a line. There's a link in the show notes below. So, that's it. That's your primer. If this video has convinced any of you to go out and buy a Schmidt book for yourself, I consider it a roaring success. I hope you got something out of it, and uh, drop me a comment below if you've got any questions. Thank you to my spectacular editor, Nick Brody, who 
through whatever magic he does on his end, managed to take a pile of messy iPhone clips and turn it into an actually coherent video. Damn good at what he does, and he's very quick to turn out a finished product. Hit him up if you're interested in having some editing work done. I'll link his contacts socials below. Stay tuned for more Schmidt content in the coming months. Got a lot of it planned. In the meantime, stay excellent, Schmidt heads. Yeah, I, I regret it too. Thank <laughs> you.